Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you to our speakers and thank you to all the audiences in the room. My name is Shikeba Ahmadi and I'm working with the Women in Peacemaking team at the CMI. Today's webinar is organized by the CMI Mati Ehtisari Peace Foundation in coordination with the UN Youth of Finland at the occasion of the Youth Peace Week 2023. The CMI is an independent Finnish organization which works to prevent and resolve conflicts through dialogue and mediation. On the practical notes, please note that this webinar is being recorded and streamed live on CMI's YouTube channel. We encourage you to tweet and discuss the webinar actively on Twitter and other social media platforms using the hashtag Youth Activism for Peace. And I believe more information will follow in the chat box. About the structure of the panel today, we have 40 minutes for discussion and we'll try to have 10 to 15 minutes towards the end for the Q&A. So please feel free to use the Q&A option in posting your questions whenever they arise. And just to contextualize the agenda of today a little bit, in 2015, the UN Security Council adopted Resolution 2250 on youth peace and security, which was thought to be a landmark resolution to recognize youth's positive contributions to peace building and to unpack stereotypes about youth for causing violence. However, meaningful inclusion of youth remains a challenge in existing power structures. Nevertheless, young people have been able to identify cracks in, the, in both formal and informal settings for their contribution of societal transformation, and they have also advocated for a seat at the decision-making table, while in some cases they have created their own table to push for social change. Today, we are here to unfold models of youth activism and learn young activists' experiences, their approaches for change, challenges and opportunities, and their vision for sustainable peace. I would like to also mention that the current situation in nagorno karabakh underlines the need for peaceful dialogue among youth and other stakeholders. We have speakers from Armenia and Azerbaijan with us as peace builders in this session. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our panelists today. We have four panelists in this session. We have Lucine Kusakian with us, who is a human rights specialist and a peace practitioner from Armenia. She is the co-founder of Frontline Youth Network, a platform to connect, educate, and empower women and youth from rural and borderline communities. She has over seven years of experience in gender and peace education and youth work on the grassroots and advocacy levels. Currently, she is promoting peace education in public schools in Armenia and advocating for a more intersectional and comprehensive approach to peace building. Welcome to the panel, Lucene. Then we have Lala Safarli with us, who is the co-founder of the Sara movement, which is dedicated to gender equality, women's empowerment, and increasing women's participation in peace building initiatives. Lala has organized impactful workshops on peace building and coexistence at the Bargo Foundation. Her dedication to sustainable peace is further exemplified by her role as facilitator at the Youth Peace Camp 2023 organized by the Council of Europe. Lala has also organized the Shamkir Winter School on Conflict Resolution and Dialogue for Azerbaijani Youth. Welcome to the panel, Lala. We're glad to have you. Then we have with us Muhammad Abu Shamala, who's a young activist based in the Gaza Strip, Palestine. He graduated from the Faculty of English Language and Translation at Al Azhar University. As a young activist, he has joined many community-related initiatives, projects, and organizations, believing in the importance of voluntary work in building community and improving the skills of youth. Welcome to the panel, Muhammad. Then we have with us Husna Jalal, 
who is a women's rights activist and peace advocate from Afghanistan, who's now has worked tremendously for civil and political rights, especially for the promotion of the political rights of Afghan women. Ms. Jalal is the founder of the Young Afghan Women's Movement in Afghanistan and the associate founder of the Freedom Message newspaper. Ms. Jalal was forced to leave Afghanistan after 15th of August, 2021. Welcome to the panel, Ms. Jalal. I hope, I see that she has not joined us yet, but I hope she'll be able to join, join us soon. So without further ado, I would like to get to the discussion. So I would like to address my first question to all the panelists. So perhaps I'll start asking Lola Safari. Lola, what are, please share with us your journey of activism, highlighting specific approaches and practices undertaken in your work. What does sustainable peace mean to you as a young activist reflecting on your experiences of working with you? Over to you, Lala. Thank you for the introduction, Shekiba. Hello, everyone. I'm deeply honored to be part of this conference, and especially during these times. And I'm a graduate of political science. And my journey into the world of activism began during a transformative experience in India back in 2016. Uh, I worked there as a global volunteer with young people. So I first witnessed the profound impact of activism and advocacy that can have um, impact on our world and it was there I discovered the potential of youth to be the architects of a more peaceful future. So uh, after realizing the importance of this kind of initiatives uh, upon returning to my homeland, I started organizing and facilitating projects, workshops and seminars on critical issues such as gender equality, youth participation and the peace. During my time, as you mentioned, Shekhova, during my time as a community mobilizer at uh, German International uh, Cooperation Agency, known as GIZ, I worked with IDP young people, internally displaced young people, and the, um, I saw them, I observed that this experience uh, of war, how uh, it um, took uh, their like peaceful existence. So, um, I understand that the conflict and the war could cause traumas in the lives of young people. And after that, I worked as a facilitator at Berger Foundation, where I had the uh, opportunity to interview individuals who shared uh, coexistence stories. This kind of stories are really important because young people don't have this kind of experience and they, they need to hear this kind of stories that can they start believing in peaceful coexistence. And these stories also revealed that even in face of conflict, there's always a spark of hope and the potential for reconciliation when we take the time to truly to listen each other and they understand each other. And this year uh, I became a facilitator at the Youth Peace Camp uh, organized by Council of Europe. I witnessed the power of young people. They are coming together and the transcending borders prejudices to envision a world where peace is not just an aspiration, but also a tangible reality. And in addition to my international work, I organized local projects and the recent one was the Shamkir Winter School. And the, and this winter school was so important for me because it was the first time that people from disadvantaged regions, young people from disadvantaged regions, they got the opportunity to be informed about the types of conflicts and the tools to needed to resolve this uh, conflicts through a peaceful means. And I firmly believe that change is most potent when it takes place in the field where real communities, they uh, face real challenges. And that's why I, I implement projects for vulnerable groups in disadvantaged regions of my country that it is also for me important to ensure that no one uh, left behind in our pursuit of sustainable peace. And uh, as your second question, what does sustainable peace mean to me? Reflecting on my experiences of working with you, um, I have been fortunate to engage in various approaches and also practices that have shaped my understanding of sustainable peace and it is significance, especially in the context of youth activism. So sustainable peace for me is not just the absence of conflict or war, it is the presence of justice and equity. So it is a dynamic process rooted in justice and reconciliation. It's also involved all segments of society and particularly the youth. So um, to conclude uh, my speech, uh, my journey of activism has reinforced my belief in the transformative power of youth engagement, especially building sustainable peace. And it has shown me that sustainable peace can be achieved through dialogue 
dialogue, empowerment, and inclusive participation. And um, I want to say that I am committed to continuing this journey, working hand in hand with young activists worldwide to turn our collective vision of sustainable peace into the reality. And I truly believe that we can be the change makers and the peacemakers our world so desperately needs. Thank you. Thank you very much for the amazing remarks. Um, I would like to go back to your remarks and, and highlight that, uh, as you mentioned, that the coexistence stories is very important for you to believe that this is not um, an aspiration, but it's a tangible reality. Peace is a tangible reality. And peace means for you the presence of justice and equity. Very well said, uh, Lala. Thank you very much. Now, moving on to um, Lucene for her remarks on the uh, on the question. Lucene, over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation and um, having this, giving this platform for uh, such an important discussion. Uh, well, um, probably I'm gonna start with a very personal uh, story. Um, I was born in borderline region. Um, basically, I remember I was born and raised there up until university years. And uh, what I can remember from my childhood that uh, this specific territory was um, deeply um, affected from the 90s war. And it uh, was a part of my basically childhood, daily discussions happening in the family, in the school and everywhere, basically wherever I would go. So it, it peace and conflict became personal to me first. And then uh, when I continued my education, already having an experience of um, opening door of opportunities, let's say I could um, compare my life before in the borderline region and the life in the capital and basically also abroad. And that arose so much um, sense of injustice that I wanted to fight against and basically to contribute helping my people from my region to uh, at least have those opportunities or access to opportunities, the alternative life uh, that could be there. Um, people living in my region, um, basically they need to dare to imagine peace uh, as they never seen it in their lives. And because of that, I continued studying the peace and my, I was not lucky actually to have my own explanation of peace before I studied it. That's why I cannot give very personal approach to that, but it's becoming, it is becoming more daily activity to me um, to feel the peace every day. Um, and, you know, it is so connected to um, the political situation to a very local situation, what is happening inside you, and it is getting complex, even harder to uh, reach. But what I feel like um, young people have so much power, so much um, courage uh, to imagine the future they want to live in. And this is the peace is um, integrated part of the future. Uh, I feel if we um, take the leadership and earn um, our place in a decision-making tables and everywhere possible, it's gonna be easier to basically get to the point when we're gonna be enjoying the uh, it. So that was very personal approach, but um, because of all this, I also um, co-founded the organization the aim of which was basically to connect, educate, and empower young people from rural and borderline areas. Um, we started with very grassroots activism, uh, having discussions locally, uh, marching together, um, applying non-formal educational toolbox. But um, then we also saw after 2020 word that it is not enough. Uh, so we needed to make our practices more institutional and also impactful when it comes to state decisions. That's why um, we, we started the advocacy efforts. Um, and then uh, also we believed that the education and any behavior that strikes our 
daily activities should be based on specific values. And peace is one of the core values, basically what drives our activism. I will stop at the moment and then share uh, more um, yeah, uh, about what is right now happening. I mentioned that peace is everyday activity and because of unfortunate situation right now in Nagorno-Karabakh, um, basically uh, starting from December of last year, uh, the people um, of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh living um, in, in those territories were blocked. Um, the the uh, corridor bridging uh, the, this specific territory to Armenia uh, was blockade, in a blockade. And because of that, um, like um, there was no access basically um, to food, any, any kind of uh, resources. And then unfortunately the day later of um, getting the first humanitarian aid, um, like uh, attacks started, very violent attacks started. And now people are um, usually in shelters or have to um, get displaced. And this is becoming another humanitarian crisis, which cannot be basically, which is still um, a very um, uh, influencing to uh, both physical and emotional aspect of uh, young people. And I'm gonna point out young people here because those people don't have experience of going through such situations and their actions sometimes uh, could be not uh, based on very rational decisions, but very emotional. And this is something that um, uh, my organization also tries to work at the moment, uh, how to help those people to also yeah. overcome the stress. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Lucene. I, um, I recall that you said peace is a daily activity. So would you mind uh, sharing a, a couple of words what peace mean to you having worked with you in a couple of words? Thank you. Yes, sure. Basically, um, yeah, as actually Lala um, mentioned, it's not just absence of violence, but also so many preconditions that you need to be able to basically live, create, do whatever you want to do. And it is getting more, um, um, more um, also individual, the way we understand and what we do for peace. Um, so it's the way we communicate with our peers. It's uh, how do we uh, believe in future and how we in, in imagine future. Uh, that is the piece basically, to be able to imagine it, to have the freedom to uh, choose whatever you want, where you want to go, what you want to create. Thank you, thank you very much. To be able to imagine peace is, is actually peace. That's, that's beautifully said. And, um, and uh, I understand that Lola also kind of said, that amidst war, there is all, always uh, a sparkle of hope. So uh, thank you very much. Now moving to uh, Muhammad, perhaps I would like to repeat the question for uh, those of us who have recently joined in the room. So Muhammad, please share with us your journey of activism, highlighting specific approaches and practices undertaken in your work. What does sustainable peace mean to you as a young activist? reflecting on your experiences of working with youth. Over to you, Mohammed. Uh, thank you, uh, Shakeba, for uh, the introduction. Uh, and, uh, thank you for uh, everyone to attendance. Uh, I can identify the sustainable piece uh, as briefly uh, after uh, Lucina and uh, Lala. Uh, when you can make your dream as real, anytime, anywhere you want, the place, that uh, give you the chance, give you the opportunity to make your dream as real. Okay, but sustainable peace means a, a state of tranquility, harmony, and stability that endures over time. That's not merely uh, like uh, Lala say, mentioned, the absence of uh, violence uh, or the absence of uh, armed conflict, but encompasses justice equality and cooperation among individuals and communities. Sustainable peace 
requires addressing the root causes of conflicts, uh, promoting social and economic development, upholding human rights, and fostering uh, a culture of tolerance and dialogue. It's a state in which people can live without fear, have access to opportunities, and enjoy their fundamental freedoms while ensuring the well-being of the future gen generation. That's in briefly after uh, Lala and Lucina said. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohammed. That's very well said, fostering culture of tolerance and dialogue uh, in, in very, uh, uh, very valid words. Would you also want to shed light a little bit on, the, uh, on your journey of activism? And if you want to share uh, some practices that, that uh, or some initiatives oh. that you have been involved. Yes. Okay, I wanna say something uh, in uh, 2021, after the aggression of the uh, Gaza Strip, uh, we launched uh, an initiative, and uh, it's the biggest national initiative uh, in Palestine. Uh, it's called the uh, we, we Will Rebuild It after the Israeli aggression on uh, Gaza Strip or Israeli attack. And uh, more of uh, 5,000 uh, people uh, uh, participate with this initiative uh, to clean up the country that what we we want to send the uh, send the uh, international community. We are together. We can uh, rebuild our community with a lot of tolerance, with a lot of love, with a lot of dreams. We are. We can make the dream. We can make the sustainable peace in our country. Thank you very much. Those are very inspiring words. So I see that um, our other panelist has not been able to join yet because of the technical issues and hopefully she can join us soon. So um, whenever she will be able to join, I'll, I'll get back to her with this question. So moving on, I would like to address my next uh, question to uh, Muhammad. So um, Muhammad, as you, you already pointed out about the uh, community level initiatives, the voluntary work and, and the importance of, of these. So it would be interesting to hear from you uh, about the importance of community level initiatives and voluntary work for youth. And could these initiatives potentially lead to more peaceful conditions in the context of Gaza Strip? Over to you. Okay. Here's why they are essential and how they can lead to positive change. Okay, uh, importance of uh, community level initiatives and voluntary social work for youth in Gaza, like one, empowerment. And uh, engaging uh, in community level initiatives and voluntary social work empowers young people in Gaza by giving them uh, a sense of purpose and agency. It allows them to take an, an, an active role in addressing local challenges. Skill development. Youth involved in such initiatives gain practical skills, leadership experience, and deeper understanding of their communities. Needs uh, that skills can be valuable for their personal and professional development. Social cohesion. These initiatives foster a sense of belonging and social cohesion among young people. They provide a platform for youth uh, from diverse backgrounds to come together, collaborate, and build relationships based on shared goals. Uh, problem solving, youth-led uh, youth -led initiative uh, often tackle pressing community issues such as poverty, employment, education, and healthcare by working on solutions uh, to these problems. Young people can make a, a tangible impact on their communities. Peace building, community level, uh, initiatives and voluntary social work can play a crucial role in peace building efforts. They promote dialogue, cooperation, and conflict resolution skills among young people, which are essential components of building be uh, peaceful societies. Uh, thank you very much. As, as you um, touched upon the grassroots level uh, work, 
the, the community level work, it is in a way very important in terms of understanding the context and the need of the people. So the youth being involved in these locally driven initiatives, they are well aware of the needs of the community uh, with the aspect of having, uh, of course, the dimension of that young age to, to the initiative that makes it, um, of course, if, if, if utilized and if mobilized effectively, it can change uh, their conditions uh, into more peaceful ones. Thank you very much, Muhammad. Now, um, as we touched a little bit on the um, sensitivities uh, earlier, it would be um, nice to hear from, um, from Lusene uh, about her current work. So Lusene, how do you appro approach the topic of peace with youth in the current circumstances? And what are the objectives of peace education in Armenia? And uh, please feel free to shed light on the challenges and opportunities, if any. Thank you very much for the question. Um, basically, peace has always been a sensitive topic um, in any war-torn societies. And this is also the case. Um, it was always there when it comes to family or domestic discussions, but uh, when it comes to more political uh, ones, everyone would basically uh, not use at least the word, but uh, yeah, uh, pick some alternatives. Um, this was also the case when it comes to the education. Well, traditionally, um, those were the topics, uh, peace building uh, and all, everything connected with that were the topic that civil society would push forward, uh, but it was never, um, you know, locally owned, I might say, uh, because people didn't see uh, how they were helping the situation. Uh, and this was the place for security people, um, um, military involvement and young people, uh, they never had a voice there. Uh, so this is changing, uh, hopefully. Um, there are specific, at least since 2018, uh, when the government changed in Armenia, the, there was more opportunity to talk about peace. Um, which is good and bad, um, but it is um, like a debateful topic. But uh, my organization, I mentioned it started on very grassroots level, starting with non-formal talks uh, about peace. But at some point when we saw that there is an opportunity to also um, make it more institutional, we uh, took the opportunity and also, um, and also created a content uh, which could be helpful for public school. At the moment, um, we have two handbooks that are confirmed by the Minister of Education uh, for teachers how to teach uh, topics on peace and how have to have all those uncomfortable discussions when it comes to building peace and what can be involvement of young people in that. There is no answers to that, but at least there is a space to discuss it. Um, of course, it is getting harder and harder every time when um, crisis hits um, and um, the room for such discussions uh, gets more limited. But um, I, I must say that um, because it, the process already started, young people have more ownership and also responsibility uh, and they also see their role, how they can influence it. And you mentioned at the very beginning, there is this uh, UN resolution on youth peace and security. It is not still um, adopted as a national action plan, but there is another one, women peace security, that actually is related to that, which recognizes, both of them recognize how war and conflict hits everyone, but um, so everyone experiences, but in a different way. It's the case also with young people. Um, so it also means that their needs are different and they should also be addressed differently. Um, so in Armenia, at least I can say that there is a space for discussion uh, without any solutions because, uh, well, one solution wouldn't fit all um, uh, situations, but um, it is getting less tabooed topic at least, um, but there should be more um, awareness on this. And also the environment should be also friendly in order to uh, foster such kind of discussions. And you know, another issue is like, whenever you start such discussions, anyone would uh, ask like, 
what is happening in the other side if everyone wants the same uh, and this is another topic i believe international community has more role in that make sure that all those developments they uh, happen uh, at least simultaneously equally and so that we can also have uh, this um, uh, more agency basically also to talk that yeah changes are happening they might be slow but we need to believe in that and solidarity is the key um, when it comes to young people so yeah I might stop probably here yeah thank, thank you very much for your intervention uh, you uh, touched upon the local ownership and the importance of the local ownership in the grassroots level initiatives. Um, of course, it is a process which should be empowered in the initiatives, although um, in some cases the top down approaches might have been effective, but in most of the cases, the uh, bottom up approaches have been really result oriented or um, re result generating uh, in certain contexts. And it's so important to connect with one another and educate. So when you connect, you would know that if people have the same ideas or different ideas, and when you educate, you will be more aware. So automatic, automatically, it's, it is a form of empowering and, uh, and uh, providing or helping to awaken the agency. So thank you very much, uh, Lucine, uh, for the wonderful remarks. Now I will, I will move uh, uh, to, uh, to Lala. Uh, for the as, as we have somehow touched upon the uh, the national challenges and perhaps some opportunities, it would be uh, great to go and touch a little bit uh, about the regional opportunities and the challenges. So, um, Lana, how can we promote inclusion of youth in regional peace initiatives? And what are the obstacles? And where do you see the opportunities? Over to you. So for me, the inclusion of young people in peace initiatives is not only a matter of choice, but um, a necessity, and especially considering how conflict and the war impact lives of youngsters. Uh, in, our, in my country, there are more than 2 million young people who, like everyone else, yearn for a life free from devastating effects of conflict and war. They too have experienced the pain and loss and the disruption that conflict brought. And so by excluding them from peace initiatives, we deny them the opportunity to contribute um, the solutions that could directly benefit their futures and the futures of their communities. As a young people, uh, we understand the consequence of conflict and the war better than anyone. And um, we can provide this unique insight into it is re resolution. So um, for me, inclusion isn't just about a goodwill. It is about recognizing the inherent value that these young people can bring to the table. And so they are not merely a recipient of peace, but uh, also active agents of it. So we need to give uh, young people a chance to express themselves. And we should create awareness campaigns and educational programs to inform young people about the importance of peace building and their role in it. Uh, because young people, they see themselves as a weak point. They always... Uh, leave this kind of decision-making process to older ones, but we can change this narrative. So we need to promote the inclusion of youth by creating uh, more opportunities and regional projects uh, specifically like designed to involve young individuals in peace initiatives, like peace projects only for young people. They can make decisions and they can be part of these projects. So this can involve uh, like several cases. For example, uh, first, uh, we must address the lack of chances from youth, uh, young people from the conflict affected communities to meet with their peers, uh, peers in real life, because for many young people, it is uh, rarely they have the opportunity to interact with their peers from the other side of the conflict. And I believe the the most important solution to any problem is direct communication. If we create this kind of opportunities where young people can come together and they can discuss this kind of issues and the solutions for the, these problems, we can make a change. And the, this physical separation also perpetuates these stereotypes and prejudice, making the path to peace even more challenging. Uh, so overcome this obstacle, we need to facilitate um, cultural programs, exchanges, initiatives that can bring young people together. And uh, such interaction also helps to humanize the other because we have this dehumanizing. We don't see the enemy as a human being. We see that as an enemy. But uh, in, in case like creating opportunities where 
young people can see each other in real life and can communicate with each other, we can change this mindset and we can humanize the other. Also, it will help to foster understanding and empathy between communities. And secondly, they will be crucial to um, create more online and offline plot platforms because we are living in the 21st century. It is like the digital age. So there are so many opportunities, online opportunities. We can create uh, platforms like social media channels. Uh, young people can gather and they can discuss the conflict resolution and peace. And the uh, social media is the key tool for that, promoting youth engagement in peace. And uh, this platform should also in encourage open dialogue and active participation, also exchange of ideas. I believe by establishing such platforms, we can empower young people to express their concerns and hopes and also visions for peace. For me, it is essential that both online and offline initi uh, initiatives uh, provide a safe space where young people uh, can voice their opinions without fear of any judgment or backlash. Because for some young people, uh, talking about peace or being part of any peace initiative is being disloyal to their community or not um, being patriotic. But we can change this mindset to, uh, to involve young people in regional peace work. Uh, we can do that. And uh, another there's obstacle um, I feel is that um, young people also feel like they don't have any um, power or any resource to make a difference. But we can um, change this mindset in order to organize uh, promoting activities, raising awareness uh, activities that as an individual, they are so powerful and they are stronger enough to make a change at least in their surrounding in their communities like starting the, it is a starting point for them and they can uh, after gaining enough experience they can do more activities in maybe local level even national level so another way to um, promote this youth inclusion in this peace, peace uh, initiatives engage international organizations and also donors to uh, prioritize the youth inclusion in regional peace efforts there are so many international also regional projects and the, most of them are for like 35 plus years old like we need to involve young people more this kind of um, activities this kind of initiatives and I believe by providing an uh, education also raising awareness uh, the importance of peace we can empower youngsters to be active contributors of peace especially in regional peace thank you Thank you very much for your invaluable insights. Um, definitely direct communication among youth, which would allow to humanize um, the, the other side is, is was mentioned by you, a very good point to be noted. And of course, in, in, in terms of the initiatives, the youth should be allowed to lead the process. They should not be given a ready-made projects to implement as food soldiers. They should be able to design and implement and lead a process. So that opportunity and the youth to be given the space to express their opinions without judgments and backlashes. So just to uh, just to narrow down the, the ge generational gap that we see in certain contexts today. And of course, you also highlight highlighted on the response, like the responsibility of the donors and regional decision makers as well to consider youth as a stakeholder. Uh, in the community, aside from um, highlighting the role of the uh, local authorities. Thank you very much, Lala. Very insightful. Um, I see that Husna Jalal is in the room. Uh, we are happy that she has been able to connect, but I'll uh, get to the next question and then I'll go to Lucine, then I'll get back uh, to um, the initial question, addressing that to Husna. So um, as now we have discussed about the challenges and obstacles, it would be uh, great to uh, shed a little bit uh, uh, light on the uh, on the recommend on the solutions and 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 if there are any recommendations or remedies to the existing uh, situation and circumstances. So Lucene, uh, do you have any recommendations to address systematic and cultural obstacles for youth activism? Over to you. And, and please feel free to share if you have any relevant tips uh, in the current circumstances of your context. Thank you very much. I feel like I, I don't need to give general answers to that. Um, basically, it wouldn't work in a um, specific situation like this. Um, but I feel like everyone has the responsibility to do their best to help the situation, basically. 
Uh, the locals, of course, they need to be more self-aware, more conscious about the wording, the actions that they are um, doing there. But uh, probably my um, suggestion is going to be directed to international uh, community or young people, basically. I mentioned that we need to be in solidarity. And you know, when it comes to what we experience and feel and practice, it's so similar regardless where we are. So those needs that we share are common. Um, probably we need to be more empathetic towards the situation and um, also be informed to self continuously self-educate, um, be self-aware about the biases that we have, which is we can get rid of it, but at least we can um, acknowledge that they are there. And um, also to, um, as it, it was already mentioned, probably young people, uh, and it is structural thing, but they don't believe that they have power but they do, and it is uh, much. Um, so I feel like we need empowerment and not ever internalizing the conflicts that are happening. Um, and uh, while getting this empowerment that can come from family, from peers, from within, uh, we need to act, basically. Act um, in the scopes of influence that we have, I don't feel like we can change or save the world, but at, at least we can do our best to help specific situations. And uh, while doing that, we also need to acknowledge probably um, that, um, well, small changes, they do matter and never be discouraged about the situation that's probably in global um, sense might not change that fast, but the small changes, the positive contributions that are bringing daily, uh, even it is like helping someone to overcome some emotional things or um, I don't know, any situation, helping someone physically uh, is already enough. Basically do whatever is possible at the moment um, and still stay in solidarity um, with each other. I feel there are things like peace that are beyond borders and everyone wants peace. We just need to uh, make sure that um, we do our best, care about each other um, and yeah, never get discouraged and continue doing so. Thank you very much. Um, yes, acknowledging our own biases because as an individuals, we all have your, our own biases in the environments that we grow. Uh, there was a good point highlighted by Lucene and small changes matter, definitely. In Persian, we have a saying that says, khatra khatra meshavar, which means that the drops make uh, an ocean. So thank you very much, Lucene. Um, now, I'm, I'm glad to know that we have Husna Jalal with us. So I would like to get back to the uh, first question that we missed uh, her response to. So um, Husna John, please share with us your journey of activism, highlighting specific approaches and practices undertaken in your work. What does sustainable peace mean to you? As a young activist, reflecting on your experiences of working with youth, over to you. Uh, thank you, Shiki Bojan. Uh, hi to everyone. And uh, my apologies for um, what happened. It was a technical issue and it took some time for um, the person to uh, correct it. I'm glad that I'm here and a special thank to the CMI for organizing this uh, panel. I think it's a pleasure to be here and to represent uh, my sisters from Afghanistan uh, the young girls um, in this panel. Well, um, as an activist from Afghanistan uh, and as somebody who uh, who has lived in uh, inside the country in the past 20 years and uh, um, uh, we experienced um, democracy, we experienced the, you know, uh, uh, the peace process when it started in 2014 for the first time and then uh, the peace deal uh, that happened in uh, 2020 with the Taliban. Well, for me, I think uh, sustainable peace would mean an inclusive peace. Uh, 
And that's something I think that in Afghanistan, we haven't, uh, we haven't experienced that yet. So, um, and, 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 and if I talk in the context of Afghanistan, and uh, that was also the main reason that I think the, uh, the negotiations failed and then the process of peace building and peace, um, sustaining peace in the country failed, uh, especially Especially, can you, uh, do you have my uh, voice? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, sorry for that. Uh, so, so uh, especially for the young generation of um, Afghans who, uh, you know, uh, they, they have enjoyed the rights and freedom um, and, uh, and uh, especially when the uh, negotiations started, they were not part of, uh, uh, they, they were not asked, you know, that what, uh, um, what, what peace would mean for them, what kind of future they want in Afghanistan. So, so, so for me, I think overall, uh, uh, I, I can say that, you know, it should be an inclusive, a sustainable peace is an inclusive peace. Where, uh, where all the minorities, uh, the young people, uh, the older people as well are included in that process. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Husna John, as, as you shed light on the challenges with the peace process in Afghanistan. So I would like to ask you a follow-up question on that. What are the challenges of youth activism in the current context of Afghanistan? And what are the sources of motivation for youth to continue their efforts for peace. <laughs> I think uh, this is a very interesting question because uh, these days we are uh, we are all young people tackling with this issue, especially with the issue of ageism that uh, we are facing in um, in uh, the current scenario. And coming from a country that's uh, quite conservative and traditional, it's very difficult to you know have your uh, voice when you're young. So um, also culturally. Uh, we have this thing in our tradition that uh, they say that uh, unless you're not married and then you're not over 40, uh, <laughs> they don't take you very much seriously. So I think that's one of the main challenges uh, a lot of people have uh, faced, I think, and I, I am hearing it also in different platforms, ageism, and uh, uh, but still young people are fighting for it and they want to be uh, part of any process that's going on in the country, inside the country and outside the country. And they want to have their voice uh, to be heard because the future is the young people uh, of Afghanistan and the young people in other countries. And I think it would be very unfair that the older generation would decide for us that, you know, what kind of future uh, should be there and, uh, you know, um, or, or uh, what what kind of approaches should be uh, should be uh, embraced? So I think this is one of the main challenges. But of course, um, as also young activists, women activists, patriarchy is there. Uh, it's a it's a uh, very uh, uh, risky uh, challenge. And also for a lot of people who are inside the country that I'm in contact with through the movement, young Afghan women's movement. Uh, uh, the insecurity, especially after 15th of August, that uh, youth activism has been very uh, difficult for them, uh, resisting outside of uh, uh, their houses for their basic human rights. Um, as you can see also through media that a lot of these young girls are protesting and they are, uh, uh, they're protesting in a civic way, asking for their rights in the streets of Kabul and resisting for against the anti-women policies of the current regime in Afghanistan. So, so, so all these people, all these young people are trying to tackle with all these obstacles and challenges that are there uh, inside the country, but also outside of the country uh, for, for an inclusive future, for, for a future that they, they, they should have a say uh, that uh, what what kind of government is going to be there in Afghanistan, or what kind of uh, or who should be the leader? So yeah, I'm just trying to be very precise because I know that uh, it's quite late and uh, there should be time for the questions. So <laughs> so yes. uh, yeah, yes. Th thank you very much. Uh, Husna highlighted the. Um, um, the, the older generation to believe in the strength and ability of the um, 
of the younger generation. And despite a lot of contextual challenges, the young people still continue to uh, uh, to work for, for social change, for positive change. Yeah, definitely. Change. I would also like to say this last sentence that it's very important that um, the culture of tolerance should come and, you know, people, especially uh, uh, women, they should feel uh, less insecure from each other, uh, the older women and the younger women. And I think the older women should share their experiences and uh, uh, what they have learned um, uh, throughout their activism and uh, um, activism journey in Afghanistan and out, also outside of Afghanistan with the younger women. So I think they should be the policy uh, uh, givers and the younger people should be taken seriously and their voices shouldn't be discredited. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Husna John. Now, uh, we'll, uh, I understand that we are running out of time. So we'll quickly get to the next question. I would like to ask uh, the question from Lala. Um, so we have, uh, of course, talked about the other issues uh, as it is the age of modernism and uh, it would be very relevant to ask that uh, the role of digital technologies in, uh, to enhance youth activism in conflict prevention and peace building. So Lola, please feel free to also uh, share your thoughts on the earlier questions, seeking recommendations to address systematic and cultural obstacles for youth activism. Thank you and over to you. Thank you, Shakeba. So I can start uh, from the first question, digital technologies role in enhancing youth activism in conflict prevention, also in peace building. I believe that in 21st century, the, the digital tools, they are the powerful tools that amplify youth voices, enable um, global connectivity and they facilitate like innovative approach to address conflict related challenges. So digital platforms provide young activists with a global stage to share their stories, ideas and advocacy efforts. So it is also a platform to be an activist and also advocate your ideas, your beliefs, your values there. Social media blogs, online, uh, offline form, on online forms, uh, this kind of platforms allow us to reach broader audience and also mobilize support and raising awareness about pressing issues. Um, Coming back to your uh, second question about the uh, youth activism obstacles, I believe the first obstacle is young people are not taken seriously by community because uh, community, most of people believe young people have lack of um, ex uh, experience and also knowledge to be a leader. But um, uh, for me, it's not like that because in the current world, young people have more experience and more knowledge. So we need to promote this useless leadership idea. We should encourage young individuals to take on leadership roles, starting uh, from schools, their community organizations, even local governments, some, uh, even uh, parliaments. So they will have the voice and they can uh, express their ideas and the concerns in such platforms. Another solution is uh, we can, uh, we need to make sure that young people, young youth activists, they have access to resources such as funding, uh, Training and also I mentioned before, like spaces that they can express themselves. And uh, my last recommendation would be about policy reforms. Unfortunately, in some countries, uh, there is this age uh, barrier for the participation. So we need to advocate for policies that protect rights of young people and they remove barriers to their engagement, uh, their participation uh, on any kind of um, like local level and also national level participation. Yeah. Thank you very much for those final words. Uh, very well noted, uh, uh, Lola. Uh, Muhammad, we understand that in the context of uh, Palestine, youth have been able to utilize digital technologies, especially the uh, social media platforms. In some cases, they have faced uh, repercussions and uh, they have got different results. So it would be um, interesting to learn from you the role of digital technologies in youth activism, conflict prevention, and peace building in the context of Gaza Strip. Over to you. Okay. Unfortunately, I see that uh, Muhammad has uh, dropped out. So I'm gonna address the question uh, to Husna. Uh, Husna, you are the uh, founder of Young Up on Women's Movement, which is a digital movement. It would be interesting to uh, learn uh, from you uh, about the role of digital technologies. Over to you. Um, 
thank you shikiba john um i, I think uh it has benefited us uh, a lot so far, uh, especially that now we are uh, outside of the country in exile and some of our sisters are inside Afghanistan after 15th of August. So it's uh, also means to connect with people, with the young girls who are inside the country. Uh, the social media platforms such as Twitter, uh, it's helping us to connect with uh, world leaders and it's a great platform as lola said for advocacy for uh, for activism and for uh, you know for for conv uh, for sharing our messages with the world leaders with the uh, world organizations that what young people actually want uh, so 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 it has been very uh, uh, we have been uh, very uh, we have benefited a lot uh, from it and uh, in the context of afghanistan as you know that it's been I think more than 700 days that girls are not uh, allowed to go to school and university and um, you know uh, uh, these platforms digital platforms are being used for uh, education right now inside the country and uh, for 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 advocacy as well and um, I mean as you all uh, uh, might know that uh, uh, this movement that we have uh, uh, also through WhatsApp groups, uh, you know, we are connecting and I mean, overall, we are benefiting from it. And uh, it's, it's a great tool to uh, mobilize uh, women, especially young women uh, in the current uh, scenario and uh, uh, to to mobilize, to come together, and to become one voice, and uh, to advocacy for the uh, for the rights, and uh, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. I understand that I'm running over time, so quickly uh, getting back to Muhammad. Um, uh, Muhammad, please share your thoughts on the role of. Uh, digital technologies, and of course, not only reflecting on the opportunities and, and uh, facilities, but also on the shortcomings, if any, over to you. Awesome. Okay, it seems we cannot hear you. Uh, uh, you hear me? Yes. Uh, did Did you hear the question, Mohammed? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Did you hear the question? Okay, that is very unfortunate. It seems that the, the connection is not supporting. So uh, perhaps um, now I will go to the Q&A. So Can I'm you me? Yes, and it's, it's breaking, Muhammad. Yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll get to the Q&A. We will uh, take only one question as the time really does not allow uh, for more. So we are taking this uh, for our, our audiences who have been with us uh, until now. So there are a few questions in the chat and I will um, take one. Um, and, and this is of course open for all the panelists whoever wants to uh, react. Um, the question is, if we think that peace is never 100% reached, but rather peace and conflict is in line along which each society constantly move, what would be your wish to be the situation in your society in five years? And uh, what would be young people's position and status at that point? Shakipa, uh, do you hear me? I'm back. Yes, I, I can hear you, Muhammad. So perhaps we can get the final words from you and then we'll get back to the question from the Q&A. Please feel free to share. We are really running over time. Thank you. Do you, do you want me to share something uh, about digital technologies? 
yes. I'm sorry, but the internet is not stable here. Okay. That's the, the situation in Gaza. Yes. Okay. Do, do you still want to share? Uh, I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk about the digital technology, the technologies, and how can play a significant role in uh, enhancing youth activism in conflict, in conflict prevention and peace building in several ways. Information. Sharing and awareness. Digital platforms, including social media, uh, websites, and online forums, are uh, allowing ac activists to share information about conflicts, uh, human rights abuses, and uh, peace initiatives. Uh, this helps uh, raise awareness among a global audience and mobilize, uh, mobilize support for peace efforts. Communication and networking. Digital technologies enable young activists to connect with uh, like-minded uh, individuals, uh, organizations, uh, and experts across uh, geographic, geographical boundaries. Uh, this fa uh, facilitates uh, the exchange of ideas, best practice, and collaboration of peace building projects. Uh, advocacy and mobilization, uh, social media and uh, online campaigns empower youth uh, activists to advocate for uh, for peace and social justice. They can mobilize, support, organize uh, protests and influence policy, uh, policy makers uh, through digital platforms. Uh, and also data collection and uh, analysis. Digital tools can assist in collecting and analyzing uh, data related to conflicts, uh, human rights uh, violation and uh, peace building efforts. This data can inform evidence-based advocacy and policy recommendations, uh, and also educating and training. Online platforms or, uh, offer uh, opportunities for young activists uh, to access peace education and conflict uh, resolution training. They can acquire valuable skills and knowledge to contribute effectively to peace uh, initiatives. Uh, early warning systems. Digital technologies can be used to develop early warning uh, systems that monitor conflict dynamics and uh, alert uh, relevant stakeholders to emerging threats. This allows uh, for timely intervention and conflict prevention. Crisis mapping. Digital mapping tools uh, help youth activists visualize uh, conflict areas and uh, identify areas in need of uh, humanitarian assistance. These maps can aid in uh, coordination uh, of relief efforts and uh, resource uh, allocation. Uh, digital storytelling, youth activists can uh, use multimedia such as videos, uh, podcasts, and blogs to share personal stories and experiences uh, related to conflict and peace. Uh, this storytelling uh, story uh, approach can engage a, a broader audience and generate empathy and support. Uh, online uh, peace uh, building in initiatives. The virtual peace building programs and platforms can engage youth in peace dialogues, reconciliation process, uh, and uh, median, uh, median efforts uh, fostering uh, a sense of ownership and conflict resolution. However, it's important to recognize that uh, while digital technologies offer numerous opportunities for youth activism and conflict prevention and peace building, they also come with the challenges. These, these challenges include issues related to digital security, misinformation, and uh, the digital divide, uh, and equal access to technology. Uh, therefore, it's essential to address uh, these challenges and provide young activists with the necessary digital uh, literacy and uh, cybersecurity uh, skills to navigate the online landscape effectively while working uh, toward uh, sustainable peace. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very well said that the digital technologies do uh, facilitate uh, mo mobilizing youth and people, and it can also help to convey the messages to uh, policymakers and the accessibility on digital technologies for the youth uh, to be part of a process. And it can also help uh, in terms of conflict mapping. But of course, the shortcoming would include cybersecurity, misinformation, and so on. Um, hopefully, in and another convening, we can open that uh, uh, that topic. So thank you very much, Mohammed. Very well said. So uh, maybe I think it it was uh, perhaps a good time for speakers to think about the question that I uh, I read from the Q and A. So if any panelists would like to react, uh, please feel free to take the floor.
And Dear Shakiba, I can answer the first question about uh, what would I want to be uh, the situation in uh, five years. Um, unfortunately, there is a conflict uh, in my country as well. And I want in five years uh, in my country, there are uh, all nations, including Armenians and Azerbaijan, they live together in peace and uh, um, they start to believe in trusting each other. So uh, as a young person, I think our position and status at this point um, promoting this trust, uh, starting our family in our community in like in even in bigger scale, like we need to believe each other because we are the um, citizens of this country and uh, we need to promote this coexistence. Uh, so there is not like any other option that one of this uh, community will somehow uh, vanish. Uh, we need to uh, learn how to coexist, how to live together. And I hope in five years we will achieve that. Yes, thank you very much. Please allow me to end the session because we are very much over time. So I would like to end the session with, uh, uh, with the points raised by our panelists today, that peace is not an aspiration, but a tangible reality. And peace means fostering culture of tolerance and dialogue. So thank you very much for your participation today. Have a good day. Bye.